Hello, everyone. I hope uh, you're having a good day. Uh, today, we are going to have, we're going to, we're going to have one tech talk today for Build with Cello Hackathon. So the talk that we're going to do today is utilizing the refi stack thesis to propel Web3 project idea generation. Today, is joining with me, Nirvan uh, from Prima Collective and me from Cello DevRel. So yeah, in order to start, please, Nirvan, uh, could you give us a, an, a, an introduction about your great, the great work that you're doing at Climate Collective? I'd be happy to, and thanks for, thanks for having me here. It's an absolute thrill to, to be here and, and speaking to the entire Cello development community. Um, so I am Nirvan Ranganathan, the program manager at Climate Collective. Uh, as some of you may or may not know, Climate Collective is a innovation network building refi ecosystem on Celo. Uh, we started just about a year ago uh, in October of 21 with the, with the goal of uh, essentially using uh, natural capital uh, and nature to back our currencies, but really uh, have since then evolved to really supporting and developing a holistic refi ecosystem on Celo uh, that includes things like carbon offsets, plastic, land stewardship, biodiversity, a wide range of, of proxies for planetary health and ways that we can utilize Web3 towards new structures for uh, climate finance and uh, regenerative uh, activities and behaviors. That's so awesome. Cool. Yep. That's awesome, Nirvan. Thank you so much for that intro. And yeah, in order to start this conversation, let's uh, address these uh, concepts, right? Uh, let's establish the foundation of these concepts about refi, because refi is a concept and a word that right now is uh, very well here in the ecosystem, re regenerative finance. But we want to address uh, specifically what is refi from you what do you think that is a great question and really uh you'll get a lot of different responses based on who you ask if you ask uh someone from web 2 or someone I mean, maybe who's older than myself they'll think of it as refinancing your home uh so a bit of an unfortunate acronym just if you google refi refinancing your home is generally the first thing that is uh, will pop up uh, but that is certainly not what we are uh, referring to over here so awesome. what, what, what is refi actually? So this, again, I, I still, you know, even apart from the, that uh, definition of refinancing your home, even if you ask people what is regenerative finance, you'll get quite a few different responses. Uh, to some, it might be just this intersection of Web3 and climate, but I, um, I tend to take a definition and a, a way of thinking about it uh, similar to uh, Sepp Kamvar, who is one of the co-founders of Celo and is in large part where I actually first saw the word regenerative finance in the Celo forums. Uh, and what Sepp was discussing there is in, in part, I mean, I'm, I'm really uh, distilling it into a sentence here, but a financial system, reg, uh, regenerative financial system that internalizes the costs and benefits associated with changes in natural resources. Now, what does this mean? Uh, currently, we think about how we value products in the market, how we value uh, companies, how we value things in our financial system. We generally think of the environmental cost as an externality, as something that's completely separate from the core operations of a business. For example, when you buy a flight, you aren't buying, you know, paying for the carbon footprint. I mean, you're paying for the service, the oil, there's a lot of different things, but not the, the actual environmental impact, whether it's through, um, products or companies or services uh, is kind of at the moment considered external to the core kind of financial transaction that's happening. Uh, similar, we can say with GDPs and even on a more national level, um, it's more similar to the gold standard and to well, and things like roads and other, other um, forms of capital that uh, back up a country's GDP. Whereas uh, we're not, again, on that level, not quite including the natural resources that are a part of uh, any given locality. Uh, so regenerative finance, I, I see it as a system where we internalize and we really consider nature uh, and the environment as a core part of our conception of a financial system and in any activities that we do are weighing 
the costs and benefits uh, that are that will be reflected in the environment. Uh, so how do we actually achieve this? Um, the core way, I mean, the, of, of doing this uh, that we see here is building financial tooling you know, around environmental assets. As of today, uh, that's primarily been concentrated around the voluntary carbon market, uh, which we will get into too shortly, uh, but really being able to account, quantify, monify, uh, monetize all of these different natural assets uh, is, is not an easy task, especially when they weren't necessarily built to function within our you know, capitalist financial system. Uh, so we can only really monetize, measure, uh, help what we can quantify and uh, really capture in, in, in digitally, I would say. So a big part of what are we, where the bridge is here is building this composable financial tooling around environmental assets. Uh, now, of course, you may ask me why Web3? You know, this has already been done. We already have a voluntary carbon market and we have um, charities and NGOs who receive donations and allocate them to uh, other activities. Uh, if, that, if everything were perfect, we wouldn't be having, you know, the IPCC report uh, where it shows essentially a 3,000 page report about how dire the problem for, of climate change is. Uh, so clearly, you know, the systems that we have in place, they're a starting point. They're certainly something that we're, we're not uh, gawking at. And I mean, it's a, it's a great foundation, uh, but we really do think that Web3 uh, through transparency is the first bit, composability and decentralization, all of these will become a little clearer through my diagram. Uh, but really these core features of Web3 make it very well suited to addressing issues that have traditionally plagued the climate finance and voluntary carbon markets. Um, so that is what I view as what is refi. Again, I'm very open to discussions of uh, and what other people consider. Um, I will also put a small disclaimer that at Climate Collective, we really focus quite heavily on the climate aspect. Refi really does include financial inclusion, social equity, and a lot of other very important tenets. Um, but we really are focused, I would say, on on the climate side of it specifically. That's awesome. Awesome. I think that that kind of um, foundation for um, Hackathon Star is, is amazing because it's like put the, the, the foundation of, on what this trend is with this uh, this concept, this whole movement for refi is. And I will, I mean, for me, um, refi is cello aligned completely since day, since day zero. And I, will, I would like to ask you, how do you see cello aligned with refi? So I think uh, even just, let's just start with the, the easy one, which is carbon neutrality. Um, well, and let's start with even proof of stake of just that Celo is designed from the ground up to be very energy efficient and what energy that it does utilize, it offsets uh, programmatically through the block rewards and kind of as from day one, or as you said, day zero, uh, Celo has been carbon neutral, which I think uh, is a nice, it, 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 on, on some level, all proof of stake chains are going to become carbon neutral in the next, you know, if they already haven't. Uh, but I do think this it is a, a distinction where uh, if a chain is carbon neutral from day one itself, and that's really baked into its mission, vision, and values, uh, that I think is the first um, level of making Celo the home for, re or, or perfectly suitable for refi. But even more importantly, as, as I mentioned, I mean, proof of stake is the common architecture that is going to be adopted by Ethereum and the rest of the industry. Um, so why Celo? Uh, and I really think that, especially in refi, when we're bringing things back into the real world and trying to get uh, engagement with local stakeholder groups, um, really just building things back out into the real world, uh, that mobile first is absolutely essential. That we need to be able to support mobile remittances. I mean. Part of the reason we know Web2 as it is today is the mobile web uh, in large part, uh, which allows people to create content and uh, all the things we know and uh, love or don't love about Web2 uh, really is just catalyzed by the mobile web. So similarly, that is my strong belief that a mobile first platform as Celo has, has been working on for, many, for the last several years uh, is the most suitable for, for refi in the short and in the long run. Absolutely, I love it. Thank you for sharing. So 
the concept of what is refi, then how Celo is aligned to refi vision. And then I think it, this is a good moment to say that all these uh, panels talk that are gonna happen for ideation phase and then the next one that is technical phase are in the framework of uh, hackathon, right? Build with Celo hackathon. And just for all the people that are attending today or later, uh, please remember remember to access this website that is in the bottom of the page to go and read about um, the, the hackathon, all the faces that we're gonna have, all the great uh, talks that we're gonna have that for instance, in, this is the first one that we're having about concepts that we're gonna mention some frameworks, some the, 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 the refi stack thesis. Uh, to pretty much bring developers and builders, dreamer, to have as many ideas as possible to, you know, foster the mental process to create and comes with innovative ideas on top of the cell of blockchain. So now uh, we are gonna for we are gonna address the refi stack thesis. So Nirvan have made this amazing uh, proposal. That is uh, refi stack thesis. What is refi stack thesis, Nirvan? Yes. Uh, so as I I'll start with, it's a thesis. Uh, it's it's our personal take at Climate Collective of how we kind of view the broader ecosystem and the kind of sectors or different pieces of the puzzle that uh, fit together. Uh, very open to discussing this with with the community, but I do think it gives a good um, understanding or lay of the landscape of all the different places uh, where, where one could start from. Uh, so let's start with the top left as we have here, or actually the absolute top left. So the way I've structured this is the bottom six uh, tables or bottom six boxes uh, are, are parts of the stack. And what we have above are essentially regulators or the people who are uh, not directly part of the refi stack, but certainly have an influence on it, essentially, which, who are the authorities? Who does this part of the stack answer to in a way? Uh, so let me start with MRV. And that is, I would say the biggest gap, but also the most, arguably the most important piece in this entire stack. Uh, so MRV stands for measurement, reporting, and verification. Now, each of those letters and each of those activities is crucial in actually certifying that a certain activity has happened. So let's say I um, purchase, I, I take a flight from New York to LA, and then I want to offset that flight by purchasing a carbon offset uh, that originated from somewhere else in the world. How can I, sitting in the US, verify that a certain activity has happened halfway across the world in India or you know any other country? So that is where MRV comes into place. Traditionally, it's been fairly manual. Uh, you have verifiers who kind of go to, let's say, go to a forest or go to a specific region uh, and take somewhat manual measurements. Uh, but now with the uh, emergence of IoT, drones, uh, I mean, drones are still getting there. I, I certainly will say that, but IoT is, is very much uh, you know, a part of, of our daily lives already. So uh, being able to use a kind of newer technologies relating to sensors, uh, even machine learning and uh, data, big data, um, all of these different topics of being able to actually prove that some action has happened on the ground, whether that's a ton of carbon that has been you know, absorbed into the soil or a piece of plastic that has been recycled uh, from a specific landmine or, or a landfill. Um, these type of actions that we're essentially making sure you know, some, it's called essentially ground truthing or figuring out, yes, this has indeed happened and we have the data to back that up. Uh, so as you can imagine, that is also, I mean, that is the toughest, in a way, the toughest part of to create a clear standard for the data, uh, both capturing and storing it, um, and then kind of analyzing it and making it into useful uh, conclusions that you'd be able to essentially certify, okay, one ton of carbon has been sequestered from this project based on the, this data that I've collected. So that's the first part. Uh, MRV is what underpins anything uh, of supply in the market. Uh, so what does supply mean here? That could mean carbon offset projects such as a 
let's say, reforestation in Brazil that Moss is working on, or uh, a renewable energy, uh, let's say, wind farm in India, or um, the plugging of an old oil and gas well that is otherwise leaking methane uh, and leaking a lot of greenhouse gases. Uh, so supply actually means these underlying uh, carbon offsets projects that we can say, or uh, I mean, that's a bit of a narrow lens to take it through. We can also consider supply as, uh, let's say, a, a waste management company who essentially removes plastic from otherwise going to a landfill. Um, there's a lot of, essentially, these, these are the climate positive projects that are actually on the ground um, that you know, are, are either can be it can be financed in various different ways. I won't go too deep into that just yet, but essentially you can finance projects that will happen in the future. There's some interesting formats there. Uh, but again, supply really does depend on your ability to prove that X action has, has really happened. Uh, so MRV and supply go hand in hand. Uh, so once we have our supply and say, okay, let's in this case say uh, for simplicity, a carbon offset project of a reforestation project in Brazil. Now we have the data to prove it, and we have auditors who have come in and said, okay, this, this does in fact work. Uh, what do we do from it from there? You can uh, either directly go to the demand, uh, which is what the traditional market has done, or you can tokenize this and have a number of interesting applications that you're able to then plug into uh, in beyond just, uh, let's say, corporate demands and ESG pledges like that. So one thing I do like to say when we move to the next part of it is tokenization. And this I think is where a lot of hackathon projects can also potentially focus, focus efforts on, uh, assuming that you wouldn't want to go and start a new wind farm during the span of the Cello hackathon. Um, I'd really, yeah, tokenization would be the next step. So the things to keep in mind here is, you know, what specifically are you tokenizing? What is your basis for this claim on chain? Are you tokenizing, is it, for example, if you're tokenizing a Vera credit uh, or a credit from a carbon registry, what is your claim? Is it the terms of service? Is it their legal guarantee that you're tokenizing? Is it an invoice? You know, what specifically is the link back to the real world? Uh, and I think there's a lot of interesting, as I, I mentioned a couple examples, let's say off-chain carbon credits, uh, we, uh, recycling invoices, um, land titles, there's a number of different things that can be real world, real world assets that, that can be tokenized. Um, some of them can be NFTs, some of them can be fungible tokens, it really depends on the nature of the project. Uh, for instance, Toucan Protocol tokenizes, it starts as an NFT, but is then fractionalized so as you to support the next box that we have here, um, which is liquidity. So ultimately you need to once you, once you have your supply and the underlying data uh, and you have brought this asset on chain, either as an NFT or as a fungible token, uh, now you need liquidity uh, in order to support any purchases of this. Uh, so what does that mean? You can either have it listed on centralized exchanges, decentralized exchanges like Uniswap, Ubiswap, Symmetric. Uh, it can be included in indices, uh, in thematic, let's say, baskets of where, or let's say we want uh, Nature-based carbon tokens can be its own basket or index. Uh, you can have structured marketplaces such as Senkin, which actually just launched yesterday. Uh, the elevator pitch for that is OpenSea for carbon credits, essentially, where you're able to buy either a full or partial uh, NFT through the, the Senkin platform directly. Uh, so again, uh, these tokenization and liquidity are fairly interconnected uh, because you need to be able to, whatever you tokenize ultimately should be in a format that can be sold or at least have enough liquidity to be uh, purchased on the market by anybody who would want to have, have demand for that. So traditionally, and that moves us to the next box over there, traditionally demand has you know come from net zero pledges, in, in certain cases regulations, but oftentimes ESG commitments, net zero pledges. Uh, from larger companies who want to uh, offset their carbon in a transparent and almost for a PR purposes, uh, I will say. But increasingly, there is regulation that is kind of forcing companies to have to take this very seriously. Uh, so 
beyond those, I think that the two ones that I would really like to focus on here, and especially for, for hackathon ideas and, and use cases, is the bottom two, embedded offsetting and programmatic demand. Um, what does what do these mean? So embedded offsetting, it so it's I would say the the opposite of let's say I wake up when I woke up this morning I didn't necessarily feel guilty about my carbon footprint and have an urge to go uh, buy some carbon offsets. But let's say I order some lunch from DoorDash or Grubhub or Uber Eats. You know there's a carbon offset uh, carbon footprint there that is again as I going back to what is refi that is not really accounted for in that initial transaction. So what is, you know, how can we address that? For instance, there's one app on Celo called FlyWallet that allows you to offset your, your flight trans, uh, your, the carbon footprint of your flight when the same transaction as when you buy the flight ticket at the same time you can buy the carbon offsets and kind of embed it into that transaction. Uh, and I certainly see that extending to a lot of different walks of life, whether that's mm -hmm. transportation or what I mentioned of DoorDash, Ubers, any, any Thing like that, uh, deliveries, uh, food supply chain. There's a lot of ways to, um, for, uh, for uh, kind of embed uh, these climate action and uh, climate consciousness into existing applications and products. Uh, so that is, I, I see a wide variety of use cases where embedded offsets could be. I mean, even in an NFT marketplace, for instance. Uh, and lastly, programmatic demand, which is really kind of where the climate collective even emerged from, uh, which is essentially having the seller reserve be a purchaser of natural capital assets such that as the adoption of mental stable assets such as CUSD, CEUR, the other stable assets grows, so too does our ability, does the allocation of natural capital assets in the seller reserve and it essentially will be able to keep kind of buying more and more natural capital assets uh, in line with the supply of, of the stable currencies. So we see that, I mean, that was first pioneered about a year ago by KlimaDAO in a very different structure and a different uh, currency that they were collateralizing, but similar idea of creating this on-chain programmatic um, demand for uh, carbon offsets and other climate positive assets. Um, so last, but very much not least, we go, kind of, we'll come full circle to the participation. So first thing is, I mean, in order, why would any large company decide to allocate money from its budget that it could otherwise use you know, for profits? Uh, why would they decide to do ESG pledges and things like that? A lot of it is consumer pressure. Uh, so that's the first part is ultimately we do need people who care about the climate and who are voicing these concerns to, uh, to companies, to innovators, to builders that at, at the very least that we have participation and um, an understanding that look, this is an urgent issue that we need to to address very urgent, uh, with with our money, with our talent, with our uh, efforts. So first is you know advocacy and education about how uh, of of the broader issues. Uh, but then I would say it's a, a large part of it is really stakeholder engagement, and this is something that we at Climate Collective have, been, have tried to be very careful of. Of we don't want to reintroduce any elements of you know, what you was called as colonialism or even of just not being considerate of what uh, is other people's plans in a way of uh, we we want to I mean, oftentimes when we're creating financial abstractions on top of things I and mean, a lot gets lost in this abstraction I mean ultimately even if we're developing a carbon offset somewhere else that can be someone's home or someone's uh, ancestral lands and we need to be very careful and considerate uh, to make sure that A, we're involving everybody in the solution, um, making sure that we're engaging the correct stakeholders early on in the process, um, and really just trying to support and not uh, force people, force solutions that are not comfortable for people. We're really working together and making sure that whatever we do, we're doing respectfully. Um, the last piece here that I'll just say to tie us back full circle is remittances. Uh, and that's, again, where, as I alluded to earlier, I think. Celo is very well positioned with, with the mobile first architecture and, and infrastructure. Uh, folks like Valora, Umoja, who are you know, really trying to solve for this problem of how can I disperse a large amount of money that it, let's say maybe may have been paid from JP Morgan or some large bank uh, among a huge amount, a huge community of 
I'm just making up numbers, but 50,000 people or how, uh, why at scale, how are you handling these climate finance disbursements without running around the countryside with wads of cash, which as we all know is quite unsafe and impractical. Uh, so one could see a world where eventually we are, everybody participates in MRV measurement reporting verification activities um, through their mobile phone or through, through other mechanisms and is eventually in, uh, rewarded for it and uh, by the this ease of remittances that we have on Celo. Um, so that I would say is kind of sums up, uh, brings us full circle, but just to recap, um, on the left, the left vertical uh, is, is really about, let's say the layer zero issues with uh, pertaining to land and how can we engage people in the solution and verify that something is actually happening in a completely different part of the world as given permission by government authorities. So I mean, ultimately who, who are the MRV and participants ask, answering to? To government authorities who provide property deeds um, uh, and things like that, or permission to actually install a sensor in a certain area, uh, things like that. The middle part, supply and demand, also there's a large interplay there uh, that supply often answers to the signals of the demand. Um, and how are these two at the moment connected is through standards bodies like Vera, Gold Standard, uh, American Carbon Registry, places like that, that act as I would say a middleman between the supply and demand uh, and are able to say provide a stamp of approval, but also a certain standard that projects need to meet in order to uh, have this a, a certification uh, that certain demand um, bodies are, are, are looking for. So we have the supply and demand side that is governed or at least arbitrated by the standard bodies. Uh, and last but not least, the tokenization and liquidity pieces, which again, uh, there's a large interplay there uh, where you should one should tokenize in the structure that makes the most sense legally and off-chain wise, but also in terms of how you're able to structure and develop liquidity for uh, that token. Uh, and ultimately those would be you know governed by the same two, but if anybody financial regulators, but uh, that is, um, I would say that the last part of the stack where we can focus on. That is awesome. That is a lot of information, right? Uh, well, it's a lot to squeeze into 15 minutes there. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much for all this walkthrough. To, so just to uh, put in context, we started with defining context, defining uh, concepts. Then we mentioned on how Celo is related to refi mission to then go to a more like tangible framework to see all the areas on, on where refi touch and how it relates um, from the government authorities and their bodies and financial regulators to give you know these teams that are gonna build great products and projects on top of cello blockchain a clear idea on what areas could they address with their ideas. So this is a map to you to be innovated on top of it. And now I think that a good segue to this is we have this framework, but usually people uh, need like a more example perspective. And, th and that there is where you are going to share a mirror board, uh, Nirvan, to share um, these examples on how these areas interrelate each other in the refi areas, correct? Exactly. Awesome. Let me remove this. Um, you're good to go. Great. Uh, so are you able to, to see the screen? Yes, we are. Great. Um, so this is another, I mean, it's, it's structured around a similar uh, concept that we spoke before. It wasn't as easy to include on a slide, but just wanted to show how this is shaping up in the Celo ecosystem uh, and maybe provide some interesting pointers towards different projects. Uh, just for uh, clarity, this is, I would say, a climate collective slash cello map. Uh, we are, this is the color coding where blue has received a grant from climate collective. Orange is the like founding members or members who have been onboarded after. Green is members of the cello ecosystem who aren't like formally part of climate collective, but we work with quite closely. Uh, and 
Purples are external parties who are not necessarily in Web3, but uh, have a barrier or, or, you know, not necessarily tied to our specific activities, but uh, are relevant here nonetheless. Um, so as mentioned, you know, we again start from participation. Um, Refi DAO and, uh, Ref, uh, and Kernel are two excellent, I would say, accelerator programs and educational programs that are really educating people and getting folks excited about, first off, about climate action, whether or not it's on Web 2 or Web 3, uh, but then really showing the merits of what is going on in the space and why this is something that is worth devoting your time, effort, and energy towards. Uh, Refi Spring is a lot of, uh, I would say, an event series, uh, again, with a similar um, motivation, but really to galvanize on the ground activity towards um, uh, towards refi. And as mentioned, you know, Valora and Umoja are going to be key pieces of infrastructure that ultimately will support MRV activities and really ultimately, I think, close the loop where uh, ultimately when we want to, uh, if one buys a carbon offset, the person, there's someone who's on the other side of the world who's literally or metaphorically planting a tree or doing some climate positive action. So making sure that we come full circle and use cello technologies to ultimately benefit the local communities who are doing all of this hard work um, is, is absolutely key here. Uh, so I think that is one thing that, uh, one, one area that we are very focused on of, of completing this life cycle uh, and let's say royalties or uh, equity ownership for carbon project developers, uh, but that's, let's say, the, the bottom left with participation. These are uh, the core players who we've been working with uh, on, on, that, um, on that regard. So let me follow this arrow over here and say, in order for participation to happen, or MRV to happen, we ultimately do need people who are participating, uh, going out, developing these projects, going and installing sensors and verifying that the sensors are operational, things like that. So. These are the various different players who, in our orbit, who are working very actively on this on these projects. Uh, one that I'd like to, to highlight here is Astro Protocol, who's developing very interesting geospatial tooling for smart contracts. Uh, you'll see that on the next slide as well for uh, a suggestion for a project idea. But Astro Protocol specifically, I think, is well, it, this geospatial technologies can be used, you know, on refi and beyond. I can see. Uh, for example, even a metaverse application that will plug into geospatial coordinations uh, coordinates at a different at a later date. Uh, but we see these are the various different companies who are working on essentially using Web3 tools to improve the way MRV is done uh, and more accurately compensate the participants who are contributing to this MRV. Uh, so now again, once we have the MRV, we have the supply of projects that are actually kind of originating new carbon projects. So these are some of the names that we have here. Um, and the one that's in purple is essentially a ratings agency that says, okay, this carbon project is a triple A or a double B or a C, like a low quality, quality product, carbon project um, uh, that we're able to see. So this is another kind of area of focus. Even if you know it's hard to originate projects sitting behind a screen as I do, but we can certainly start coming up with better evaluation frameworks uh, based on existing work as well uh, that we're able to uh, rank on a registry of, of various different assets. Uh, but again, tokenization is where a lot of our members and grantees spend the most time. Uh, sometimes even if you're not originating a new supply, you're creating a new structure for this supply to live and generate demand for it. Uh, so again, the prominent players here are Toucan Protocol and Flow Carbon, uh, both of whom are um, developing different approaches towards tokenizing existing carbon credits, whereas Untangled Finance is a bit more similar to Goldfinch, where it's tokenizing uh, real-world assets such as loans for home solar um, activities uh, and other sorts of, of debt, essentially. Um, plastics, I just want to highlight that you know it's not just carbon. Uh, there's a lot of things that can be supplied and tokenized. So carbon is certainly a large part of it, but plastic is uh, so real world assets such as debt capital, plastics, uh, wildlife, uh, I think is the most in very interesting example here, a company called Wildchain, which is 
uh, doing a similar process, but for conserving wildlife instead. Uh, so all to say, there's a lot of different types of environmental assets and different ways to tokenize them. These are some interesting initial approaches to it uh, and initial assets, but certainly think there's a wide room to play here. I'll very briefly, uh, you know, these are kind of the development companies that have been helping us and helping these uh, these uh, projects actually uh, come to light. So Curve Labs, Bite Rocket, C Labs have all been incredible. Well, everybody listed here have been excellent partners uh, for, for building so far, but we really hope to add more names here uh, from folks in the hackathon, ideally. Um, that is awesome. And hopefully we will. We will. We will after this hackathon. Exactly. Um, uh, that's the now, main parts I wanted to cover. Uh, so thank you, Esther, for that. That's awesome. Thank you so much for sharing. So, you know, we have gone through all the road since concepts, examples, uh, framework, and then example, and how you can see this framework for ab about how refi touch different areas. And now I think that before jumping on, on a few calls that we and have. Sorry, just... real. And, and last thing, Nestor, I just wanted to, to point out there is real. Uh, like, so the last thing is that as you notice, I mean, there's no one company that is building this entire stack, right? Ultimately, you have maybe 50 different companies listed here, all working on one piece of the puzzle. And, that's the concept behind the stack, is that no one company or developer should attempt to solve a, create a silver bullet for this entire part. Is that you find your area of focus and plug into what the rest of the ecosystem is doing and we'll all move uh, greater than the sum of our parts, but also much faster and in, in great alignment. So that's all I wanted to point out, that it's a large puzzle that we're all solving together and solving different pieces of it together. That's awesome. Thank you so much. And yeah, this is an ongoing, on work in progress, right? Uh, about refi uh, ecosystem. So uh, yeah, right now, I think that before jumping on a few call uh, questions that we could ask, and also we can we can re reiterate to sign for 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 people to sign to Hacker or Hackathon Build with Cello that we're running this few this next uh, months. So please sign uh, to the hackathon, and there you will find all the information regarding the hackathon. And of course, you can uh, ask us more about specifically uh, cellular-related questions up on, on our Discord. So now let's jump on some ideas, and then we will go to some questions. What are your suggestions of ideas for projects, Nirvan? Um, so as mentioned, I mean, there's a lot of different, let's say, sectors. I've just thrown together a list of ideas here uh, that could serve as inspirational starting points. But uh, let's just quickly go down the list. As we mentioned, you know, IoT devices are huge and a critical part of this. Uh, maybe we can create a token issuance model that if the temperature in a certain region hits, let's say, 50 degrees Celsius, uh, then to issue a certain disaster relief funds based on a certain IoT device reading or maybe up it's a dynamic NFT. There's a lot of interesting interplay that we can do between uh, off-chain data from IoT devices, particularly plugged into environmental um, places uh, and connecting that, whether it's new token issuance or NFTs, uh, there's, there's a lot that can be explored there. Uh, even something as simple just as tracking the growth of an individual tree uh, that is you know, not very easy to do using satellite imagery. Um, or drones for that matter. So uh, lots of interesting uh, say ideas that we can explore with IoT. Uh, next is, you know, this is maybe not as specific to refi itself, but is very important to it because in certain cases we end up with very low liquid kind of carbon assets or let's say a land, uh, a large block of land that, you know, can't be easily sold like the same way that Bitcoin or Ethereum or Celo can be just easily transacted on the spot. Uh, so maybe there's new uh, pricing mechanisms or uh, other ways that we can you know, transact with these very unique type of assets, maybe auction protocols or crowdfunding or bids. There's uh, things like that that I would say provide a different sort of market uh, for these type of refi assets. Um, next, as I mentioned, uh, I think in the demand section there, that embedding offsets into applications, whether it's transportation or more broadly, uh, in, in the food industry, for instance, uh, really embedding offsets such that, you know, it's 
we're not trying to guilt or shame people into buying carbon offsets, but to just feel that it's a part of your civic responsibility to uh, just include, internalize the environmental cost um, of a certain action into the financial cost. Uh, next, I will very briefly talk about, uh, some folks may have heard about Redemption DAO and that experiment, I would really call it an experiment, but uh, essentially ways, it's similar to Constitution DAO, but instead of bidding on the US Constitution, it's you know bidding on a, a an auction for that's for oil and gas drilling or uh, for otherwise like really rapidly being able to mobilize capital uh, conditional on a certain real world um, uh, purpose. Uh, and I wrote dissolvable there because sometimes it's a case where let's say we don't meet the final goal that we set out for. People should be able to withdraw their funds uh, to the extent possible, which is something that happened uh, badly in Constitution DAO. So I think another, I mean, uh, these sort of DAOs that are transient, purpose driven, and really targeted towards achieving a specific environmental uh, other important for the ecosystem. Um, this is just another interesting idea, but we're figure. I mean, part of it is figuring out, you know, we have liquidity for natural capital assets on chain, uh, but who is actually using this market? Is it what we call DGENs? Is it green pilled people? Is it newcomers to the market? Is it institutions? Um, it's in crypto or in, in web three, it's, you know, it, it can be difficult to figure out who a certain wallet address is. Uh, but really analyzing the liquidity on chain and figuring out where it's coming from is uh, a, a, could be an important way to especially inform the demand of what is actually going on in this market. Uh, we at Climate Collective are actively working on this as well, but I do think it could be an interesting hackathon um, analysis project. Uh, as I mentioned before, geospatial logic in apps using Astro Protocol. Uh, if you just uh, go them, you'll be able to see docs, uh, their, their documentation. They have some very interesting concepts uh, and implementations of decentralized identifiers or what they call geo DIDs, geo NFTs. Uh, some very interesting work that one can build off of there. Uh, and that is, I would say, highlighted in the Collectivo project that is just being piloted in Curacao and will be launching in Q4. Uh, but Astro Protocol has some excellent tools to build off of. And lastly, you know, any interoperable apps with Climate Collective members or grantees, you can go on our website, read our Medium posts for all of the different projects we're involved with. Uh, we, as, as I mentioned uh, to earlier, it's, we are really trying to put the different pieces of the puzzle together. Uh, and this is what we're all about, building composably, building on interoperably, uh, enhancing existing work that's already happened. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nirvan. So I don't know. I think that this is awesome from a whole perspective on how we have addressed concepts, a framework, examples, and then ideas what developers and funders could read and say, hey, you know, I would like to work on this during this hackathon. So there's the whole package for developers and builders, dreamers, and I think that now we just could have one question. That is, uh, what additional opportunities would you like to highlight for developers? What additional opportunities would I like to highlight for developers? It's a bit of a broad question, um, but I would, uh, yeah, I think, reiterate a couple of the the projects and resources I mentioned. So starting with Astral Protocol, as mentioned here, uh, Umoja, I think, is a fantastic tool for actually dispersing funds on a large scale. Uh, I think that's another, If I, I, I hope I'm answering your question. Uh, additional resources that can be used towards, uh, um, towards the hackathon. But uh, Astral Protocol, uh, Umoja, I would also recommend uh, Celo has some great development resources. For for example, there's a DAP starter kit uh, published by the developer relations team on Celo. Um, I I think these are some good resources to start with. Um, yeah, that's awesome. Well, I think that will be all for for uh, this talk. We are gonna have many talks. Right, this week is about ideation phase. 
Uh, now we ended with a with a very solid framework on how to understand the areas uh, on where refi address uh, areas. And then for next week, we will for tomorrow, actually, we will have an, another interesting uh, panel discussion about social impact and define what is impact first. So yeah, I invite you all for tomorrow talk. We, you know that you can reach us at chat.cell.org and also you can look for all the information regarding this hackathon in Hacker Earth link here. And I just uh, can say thank you so much, Nirvan, for your time, for your ex expertise on share with us this, this thesis uh, for ReFi. My pleasure. And I'm going to be publishing it in the Cello forums as well. Uh, and very curious of what the feedback from the developer community will be. Uh, awesome. Well, yes. I think that will be all. Any any final words, Nirvan? Uh, just wanted to wish everyone in the hackathon all the best. This is how I entered the Cello ecosystem as well, and I think is the best way to really get a feeling for the community and just how amazing and supportive the the Cello team and the broader community is. Uh, if just wanted to put a plug for Climate Collective and say, I mean, you can reach out to us as well on on our website or through info at Climate Collective. Uh, we are always open to uh, giving advice or just more broadly talk, talking about our thoughts about the space. Awesome. Well, thank you so much all. See you next time. Goodbye. Thank you, Nestor.